According to the theory of evolution, the origin and development of the universe and all its systems can be explained solely on the basis of time, chance, and continuing processes. All living things have arisen from a single-celled organism. A second and opposing worldview is the concept of creation. According to the theory of creation, everything in the universe has come into being through the design, purpose, and deliberate acts of a supernatural creator. That means this creator created the universe, the earth, and all life on earth, including all types of plants and animals, as well as humans. On today's edition of Origins, beauty is skin deep, the color of our skin. Hello, my friends. Welcome to Origins. I'm Don Chapman, and I'm your host. Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and use it to validate the truth of creation. Now, today we're talking about a subject that I think the church really desperately needs to address, and that's the whole, uh, whole subject of uh, the color of our skin, and that brings up the whole issue of race. Uh, evolution has kind of been on the wrong side of that one sometimes, hasn't it? Well, I think so, Don, and you could argue that some in the church have been too, but uh, Absolutely. Uh, as uh, Stephen Jay Gould once said, who was uh, a very well-known evolutionist at Harvard University, has recently passed away, uh, in a uh, book called The Mismeasure of Man, in which he showed the role of observer bias in skewing the size of the cranial vault larger for Caucasians and smaller for like American Indians and what have you. Uh, he said in the book that, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's pretty close, and that is uh, racism didn't begin with Darwin, but Darwin put racism on a scientific footing. And I believe that uh, is a fair assessment uh, by a person who I think could be pretty objective about this. Uh, I'm not suggesting for a moment that all Darwinists or evolutionists are racist, but the whole concept of Darwinism is consistent with racism insofar as it even among humans like Neanderthal man can declare them to be a subspecies, less than And that's still man. true today. Yes, in fact, today it's argued that Neanderthal man maybe wasn't even related to modern man, didn't uh, uh, interbreed with them or anything of the kind. And this despite the fact that we have uh, at least a few hundred uh, rather good specimens of the Neanderthal skeleton. Uh, we have uh, funerary rites, evidence of funerary rites, art, jewelry, tools of various kinds. Recently they found what is arguably a flute, a wooden flute, playable with the holes. Uh, these were people. And when we take people and declare them to be something less than Homo sapiens, even at the subspecies level, I think that opens the door to this concept of higher than and lower than uh, and ultimately racism. Uh, and Western civilization certainly has some skeletons in its closet that uh, relate to all of that, doesn't it? Yes, if we uh, go back to the World's Fair of 1904 in St. Louis, my hometown, uh, there we had a really tragic case of a, uh, a pygmy being brought over uh, from Africa, a man by the name of Otto Benga was dis uh, uh, displayed in a cage with uh, other apes and monkeys and uh, basically displayed as a living, primitive, less than human 
uh, being. And he was subsequently displayed in zoos. And uh, the poor gentleman eventually took his own life after going through an experience like that. Uh, you go back to the time of the uh, 1925 and the Scopes trial. Uh, turns out John Scopes wasn't really the biology teacher, but uh, uh, he filled in for the teacher who did teach biology at the end of the year and participated in the trial because really the textbook taught evolution. They thought that was close enough. It was Hunter Civic Biology, and to give you an idea of what constituted evolution in 1925, uh, and we just have a copy of that book That's the right here. Right this is the actual uh, edition uh, that John Scopes used uh, in the classroom. Uh, and that the biology teacher used. And in this book it says, if we follow the early history of man upon the earth, we find that at first he must have been little better than one of the lower animals. At the present time there exist upon the earth five races or varieties of men, the highest type of all, the Caucasians, represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. And that's 1925. That's not that long ago, 80 years ago or so. Right. And that was endorsed by many liberal Christian groups, uh, uh, by the American Civil Liberties Union, who initiated the whole trial. And uh, that passed for science back then. And so we could see in that the justification in the minds of the Europeans for the colonization of the world, that they felt an entitlement to pillage Africa and to steal from India and so forth. And also, you have the roots then for Hitler and the whole Aryan race and all of that. Isn't that true? Yes, I would be inclined to lump that in as well. So all of that, although racism existed prior to evolution, evolution mm -hmm. gave it scientific validity and was gasoline on the fire of racism. That's certainly my opinion. Mm -hmm. And mine as well. Well, now, it says in the book you just read, the, the, the good science book there, that the... Uh, uh, evolutionists endorsed um, in 1925 that there are five races. How many human races are there, my friend? <laughs> well, I believe as the scientific community uh, itself uh, maintains today that there really is just one race of human beings on Earth. Uh, they are known as Homo sapiens, which means uh, basically uh, we are wise. And uh, uh, the whole idea that there are different races of people have come into uh, rather serious criticism. And if you think about it, most of racism was really based just on skin color. Yeah. Maybe some other small features, thickness of the amount of fat in the eyelids and what have you, and the shape of the eye, and some small differences in skeletal shape, but primarily it's color. And, and, and those terms are used in a pejorative way usually to describe the red man and the black man and the yellow man and so forth. Mm -hmm. So talk about skin color to us, would you? Well, the intriguing thing is, uh, I hate to break the news on this, but there are no white men. Is that right? Yeah. For example, you might think I'm a white man. <laughs> Let me show you what the difference is right here, Don. This is white <laughs> and this is me. If I were this color, you could be pretty confident I would have been dead for at least a few hours. <laughs> so really, if we have very little pigment in our skin, uh, the blood shows through. We're kind of a pink color, but most of us have at least some pigment. And I think that's something we need to discuss. And if I might just go up to our Please do. magic chalkboard. Show us what you got, my friend. These are some of the different colors, so-called, that we claim to see. Uh, as we look at humans, uh, they ba basically range from uh, uh, a very light color to uh, the darker color. Uh, but it's really all one color. We're talking about differences in shade. And uh, those differences in shade are due to a special protein made in our skin or a family of proteins called the melanins. These are pigments that tend to be brown, black, and in a special form of melanin can be sort of red. We call that pheomelanin. Uh, let's look at what these pigment cells look like. You know, when we're in the womb yet as a developing uh, uh, fetus, uh, at first we really have no pigment. Uh, the pigment cells begin along the midline of the back in an area called the neural crest. And at about three to four months of development in the womb, these cells migrate out into the skin take up residence there and start to produce this pigment called melanin. And uh, these pigment granules leave the pigment cells that make them and enter the cells of the epidermis. 
Here we're looking at the deep surface of the epidermis, that's the surface layer of the skin, and the arrows are pointing to three of the pigment cells. We call them melanocytes. And next to these cells, here and here and here, all along, are cells of the epidermis that have a brown pigment in them, but they have picked up this pigment secondarily from the melanocyte. So the pigment leaves the melanocyte and goes into these cells. Why does the pigment go there? It's a sunscreen. It oh. protects us from the damaging effects of the sun hitting our skin. People who lack pigment, such as albinos, are extremely vulnerable uh, to sun irradiation, can develop basal cell carcinoma, other cancers of the skin. Whereas people with very dark skin are almost immune <laughs> to basal cell carcinoma. Uh, let's look at what these pigment cells uh, look like up close. In this uh, photograph, we've taken a picture uh, that kind of shows more detail of the pigment cell. And uh, uh, here's one right here. And if you look carefully, it looks like sort of a spider. It has long processes, and the pigment granules are produced and go out into these processes. We'll show you a kind of a blow up of that area in a cartoon. Here is the pigment cell right here. And you can see the long processes going out. And what will happen is that the other cells in the epidermis will just sort of bite the ends of those processes off, <laughs> taking the pigment into the, si into the interior of the cells of the epidermis. Now, when that occurs, one of the most remarkable things, I think, in uh, the skin is that these granules, on arriving in the epidermal cells, which make the dead layer of our skin eventually, the granules are shuttled into a position to form a perfect little umbrella over the top of the nucleus. Here are the granules here. If I outline them, they're right here. And you'll notice that forms a cap. Yes. The sun comes from down here, and it hits that little umbrella, and the umbrella protects the DNA, the genetic material, of the dividing cells in the epidermis. Without this, we would suffer tremendous genetic damage from the to sun. the cell. Yeah. Yes, from the sun. Uh -huh. And uh, let's see what that actually looks like in life. This is a picture taken through the electron microscope. Right in the middle here, there's a very high magnification, thousands and thousands of times. Right here in the middle is the nucleus that contains that special genetic material necessary to make that dead layer to protect us from drying out and what have you. And over the top, you see many of these dark granules. This is the collection of melanin. And it forms just a beautiful umbrella. And this pigment is designed to absorb ultraviolet light precisely in the wavelengths that are the most damaging to the DNA of the epidermis. Interesting thing is, if we didn't have this kind of protection, we'd get even more genetic damage than we do. But as it is, every day of our life, even setting under the floodlights in this room, we are getting genetic damage to our DNA and our epidermis. But as this damage occurs, there are special enzymes that identify it, snip it out like a little scissors, make a proper patch, and splice the patch in to repair the damaged DNA. Every living organism known from bacteria to man has this DNA repair mechanism, and it's been estimated that if they didn't have it, no life would survive. Dr. Menton, you're amazing. <laughs> At, and what you tell us about the human body is, a, is amazing as well. So we know not only that we have this special pigment in our skin, that, and we know what it's there for, that it's a protection for the, for our, uh, the nuclei of the cells there. And uh, it's like a little umbrella to protect from the sun, to, to, break, to keep us from having genetic damage. Do I have that right? Absolutely. And when genetic damage does occur, which is inevitable, we, we have a backup kit. system <laughs> that snips out the bad pieces of DNA, and puts in makes a stuff. proper corrected patch, 
and splices it in. This is actually gene splicing, but it's God's gene splicing God's going gene on splicing. right inside the cell. Well, now you hold that. We're going to come back and talk some more about this, but we've got to take a break. And don't you go anywhere. This is fascinating stuff. I think of all of, this, all of the uh, shows that we've done, this one may be one that we need to hear because it affects our basic thinking about how we look and view each other as, as people made by God. So you stay with us. We'll be right back. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. The Eyes Lens, a marvel of chemistry. Our Eyes Lens is truly a marvel of chemistry. It contains a very high concentration of protein molecules in a transparent water solution. This discovery amazed scientists because protein molecules are not transparent, but opaque. In the lens, they pack together like the molecules of a window glass. This results in the normally opaque protein solution becoming transparent. When it comes to the eye, creation makes sense while evolution leaves us questioning its logic. Today's guest on Origins, anatomist Dr. David Menton, is a speaker for Answers in Genesis. Audiences enjoy his well-illustrated presentations on a variety of fascinating topics. Many of these lectures are available on DVD. If you're interested in the subject of creation, you'll definitely want these for your own. Orders are being taken at 800-778-3390. You can also write to Answers in Genesis, P.O. Box 510, Hebron, Kentucky. 41048 or visit the website at www.answersingenesis.org We're back with Dr. David Menton and we're talking about the shades of skin and Dr. Menton has said that we all have the same uh, pigment cells and yet we have different shades of people. Could you explain to me how that works? You know, that's an interesting question, Don. Uh, about 50 years ago, scientists were able to show for the first time that all people, whether light-skinned, uh, Caucasians, or very dark-skinned people, uh, all have essentially the same number of these pigment cells or melanocytes per square inch wow. on their skin. The, the differences in shade that we see is not due to the number of pigment cells and probably not even necessarily to the amount of pigment produced by these cells, but rather to the amount of pigment that's broken down after the pigment granules have largely served their purpose. You recall we mentioned they form an umbrella. Right. They form an umbrella only over the cells that can still divide because they're vulnerable to radiation. Once that cell has decided it's going to move up in the epidermis and make the dead layer, it's never going to divide again. It's no longer vulnerable uh, to radiation. And then the pigment granules are actually digested in the cells. So if you look higher in the epidermis, you really don't see any pigment. It's all down at the bottom. But in darker skin, it's retained even at the higher levels. And so the overall skin darkness does increase considerably because you just, uh, considerably, you just don't have the pigment at the bottom. That's fascinating. Now, I, I, I think all of our viewers are probably wanting me to ask you this question. Uh, how about Adam and Eve? Do you, do you know what shade of skin they were? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. We <laughs> see them shown in most textbooks as very, very light-skinned people. They have blue people. eyes, isn't that for Blue sure? eyes, <laughs> yes, blonde hair. Uh, I think it was rather different. Let me just step up to the board here, if I might, and You step explain. up to the plate there and hit a home run, my friend. First of all, it's just in a really simple way. I'm going to oversimplify so much I'm embarrassed, but uh, we all have a double set of genes in our body, basically a set of genes we got from our mother and a set from our father. And so each gene is typically represented by two letters of the alphabet, uh, big A here, for example, and big A represents uh, the two uh, paired genes one from a father, one from a mother that exists in this individual. Now, in the case of, the, of just simplifying the genetics here of skin color, which is much more complicated than I'm making it out to be, we're assuming that there are two different kinds of genes, gene A and gene B, each double, that impact on pigment of the skin and darkness of the skin. And uh, let's say that if you have 
gene A in the capital A form, that makes a lot of melanin. And if you have two doses of it, like here, that means lots of pigment. And then gene B also contributes to pigmentation. If you have the capital letter B, uh, that means lots of melanin. And so this would be the configuration that would be the darkest. Double big A, double big B. Got it. However, you also have uh, alleles for that gene, we call it. Uh, these are alternate versions of the same gene. Uh, we'll show those as a small letter A and a small letter B, and they represent a small amount of melanin. So if our body had just little a, little e, a, little b, little b, that would be very light skin. Big A, big A, big B, big B, dark skin. Middle brown would be a combination. Big A, little a, big B, little b. So once we kind of understand this uh, <laughs> oversimplification, let's just consider uh, the situation now with uh, Adam and Eve. Had Adam and Eve simply had little a, little b, both of them, their offspring would have all been very light-skinned, and that pretty much would have been the end of the story. Everybody would be light-skinned, and it would be a pretty boring existence, frankly, Don. <laughs> If, on the other hand, Adam and Eve had had only the big A, big B's, all of their offspring would have been big A, big B. We would have all been very dark skinned, uh, much more immune to basal cell carcinoma, some real genetic advantages, uh, but uh, there are some uh, disadvantages, too, in the production of certain vitamins. But uh, anyway, if we consider, and I think this is the most likely possibility right here, that Adam and Eve were middle brown, but I still think is the most uh, beautiful skin, the Polynesian skin, the skin co uh, shade of any people on earth today. Uh, with big A and little a, big B and little b, we could produce all shades. We could produce the big A, big B. We could produce the slightly less dark, uh, a little less dark, and very light. And so I think the most likely scenario is that they had that configuration that they had big A, little a, big B, little b, and from this we can put all these combinations together, and as these people might migrate uh, after the Tower of Babel incident, you might get areas where people only had the little a, little b. There's no way they can produce the, the darker skin. Other people might have just had the large a, large b. They would have only produced darker skin, and we could have the intermediates. That's uh, amazing. I mean, you're basically telling us that from where we are today, we can look back and say that with relative certainty that Adam and Eve were middle brown and that from that, that everyone could be their descendants with the color of skin that each of us has. That's amazing to me. You know, today, Don, we have less reason to think of the different races than we did years ago. Uh, people talked about different races of people. We don't use that expression anymore. Scientists have found out in studying the human genome that the total difference between all human beings in terms of their genes is about two-tenths of one percent. That would include the difference between males and females and all the different shades of skin and everything. In fact, if we reduce our consideration just to those factors that we call racial, skin color, eye shape, bone density, things like that, the differences between races is 0.012 percent. Biologically, this is considered to be insufficient to merit being called a race. Amen. And in doing this, science has finally caught up with Scripture, and where That's all right. Christians should have been all That's along, right. but sadly weren't, where it tells us in Acts chapter 17, verse 26, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. That is a precious verse that we all are one blood, we all are one people, uh, and we all are descendants of common ancestors uh, made of God. In fact, the very nature of sin that we carry with us from Adam depends on the fact that we're all one blood, and Jesus came onto this earth to save man, homo sapiens. And That's right, uh, amen. If we dismiss someone as being less than that, it raises the question of even whether uh, they have a savior. You know, Dr. Minton, I deeply appreciate you uh, bringing us this lesson because it, 
it is something that we need to hear. We talked early on in our discussion today about the skeletons in the closet of the evolutionists, and we need to admit that in the church of Jesus Christ, there have been times when what the church has taught and believed, the prejudice that we've tolerated, uh, was certainly not the biblical record that God gave us, nor the will of God. There is absolutely no place in my mind, and I'm speaking to you now as a, as a pastor, uh, I'll just say this rather than asking you, but there is absolutely no place in the church of Jesus Christ for any racial prejudice. Uh, we are all one people, made by God, descended from Adam and Eve, and we all stand as sinners and equally in need of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's so good knowing that it's God's view, that He made you, that He died for you. And you know, that should be your worldview too. And so until the next time, God bless you. And it's been good having you with us on Origins. this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 712 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 712, Cornerstone Television, Wild Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.